You're listening to Inside Air, a behind the wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology, and operations. Hi, I'm Flight Lieutenant Chris Solly, and welcome to the latest RAF Inside Air podcast. In this episode, Deputy Commander Operations for the Royal Air Force, Air Marshal Harve Smith, a regular listener to Inside Air himself, joins us to talk about his role within air and space. And we're seeing that play out with what's happening in Ukraine, and the horrific stuff we're seeing in Ukraine and Russia's illegal invasion. And how that's ended up being, we see those scenes played back to us and it's like watching a movie from World War II little scenarios to force people to just constantly be in that mindset as opposed to I'm at home base now I just go to and from work and it's a nine to five job you don't have to look that much further into the future to realize that if things did go awry in the Pacific we are intimately linked to that you know our economy and our prosperity is intimately linked to the Pacific and the Far East as usual, we'll also reheat a few stories which might have slipped under your radar. But first, see if you can identify what this noise is. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Air Marshal Harve Smith is one of two three-star deputies to the Chief of the Air Staff in the RAF. He has responsibility for all operations the RAF are involved with globally, making sure the people, equipment, the training for ops and all the infrastructure are where they need to be at the time they're needed. UK Space Command, which he helped shape in his last role, now also falls under Air Marshal Smith's role in his new job. Agile combat employment is one of his main thrusts and as he told squadron leader Peter Lisney, in a fast-changing world, change is pretty much the only constant these days. Air Marshal Harve Smith, thank you so much for being on Inside Air. It's great to have you. It's good to be here. We were talking off air before we came on and I, uh, you know, I think it's brilliant you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Uh, every two weeks for an Inside Air podcast, quite, that's no mean feat, so good job. This. You know, any avenue to communicate with our people is incredibly important. And these these means, podcasts, again, we, we were talking, you know, I've stopped reading newspapers and I just listen to podcasts now. So it's a, it's such a cracking means of reaching out to our people. So I just wanted to start by saying I'm very grateful for your personal efforts for driving this forward and keeping it going as a going concern. Um, it's brilliant. So good. Well, we've got a fantastic team. Uh, in the Inside Air team. And and you know what, we have a lot of listeners all over the globe, so it's not just uh, our internal uh, audience. And some of them are our personnel that are serving overseas, and I know we've had that kind of feedback. It keeps them in touch with what's going on. Now, just to uh, perhaps help some of those people that are not f- within uh, the Royal Air Force, could you explain your your role? Yeah. Because you're kind of like second in command of the Royal Air Force. Yeah, well, actually, there's, there's two three-star deputies. Um, and we both have an, e- an equal role of being a deputy. Uh, if, there's, if there's time, we might be able to explore how that's about to change over the next few months as we do a major HQ operating model redesign. We've just got that cleared through the Air Force Board. Um, so I'm very happy to come back to that if there's time, or maybe we could do another episode. <laughs> uh, but so. uh, I, I, so my role then as uh, Deputy Commander Operations is effectively the day-to-day business of the Air Force. Um, all of our ops, both at home and abroad, defending the nation, uh, going overseas and uh, protecting and defending as required. Everything to the left of that, the training, the force generation, the readiness, the resilience, the being prepared to the BPT, as we do in shorthand. Uh, all of that kind of sits in my bailiwick. What's what's also quite exciting, uh, in my previous job, I was the MOD's director of space. I was the first, actually the first and the last into that job. Um, 
which, which was always the plan, come in, try and cohere everything we're doing on space, get a space command going, and then if we get that right, we won't need you anymore and you can go off and do another job. So luckily for me, I did do that, and we now have UK Space Command, and it sits under the parental ownership of the Royal Air Force, and now effectively sits under me as DCOMOPS. So not only do I have all the air stuff, but I also have the space stuff as well. Um, and that allows us to properly cohere that. Um, plus it's super exciting uh, part of our business and it's new, newer than some of the other stuff we do. So it's, it's, it's interesting because we're here to talk about the agile combat employment. Yeah. Uh, to give that some foundation, grounding, perhaps you could tell us how the uh, global threat picture has changed yeah, over the well, first few years. Well, I don't think you only, well, if you do read a newspaper or listen to a news podcast, um, you only have to do that to see how the world has quite dramatically changed in the last few years. We've always known, you know, the world, I think through my whole career, we've always said, oh, the world's a dangerous place. After 30 years of doing this, it does feel to me like it has never been more predictable or dangerous. Our, uh, our vice chief refers to it as we're in a, the dangerous decade. And I think, not to second guess what he means there, but I think what he's talking about is the unpredictability of the world. Um, and we're seeing that play out with what's happening in Ukraine, you know, the horrific stuff we're seeing in Ukraine and Russia's illegal invasion. And, how that's ended up being, we see those scenes played back to us and it's like watching a movie from World War II. Who would ever have thought that that would have happened in the 2020s, literally on our doorstep? You know, it's a three hour flight away to be in the middle of it. So um, you know, just that one thing has been a bit of a wake up call, not just for defence, but I think for the, the whole of the world in terms of how unpredictable and how dangerous things can become. And on the other, literally on the other side of the globe, we see the tensions continue to rise around China and the Pacific, uh, the, you know, with the, the kind of Taiwan debate right at the middle of that. And a lot of people say, say to me particularly, you know, why are you so interested in the Pacific? There's this big fight going on on our eastern flank. That's where our focus needs to be. But the reality, so, and that's right, you know, that's the here and now, and we must, we must make sure we do the right thing by that. Um, but if you don't have to look that much further into the future to realise that if things did go awry in the Pacific, we are intimately linked to that. You know, our economy and our prosperity is intimately linked to the Pacific and the Far East. And... If there were a major conflict to break out there, be that around the Taiwan issue or something else, it would have very, very detrimental effects to the West and to the UK in particular. So uh, protecting our interests there and understanding it, uh, intimately understanding it and being present is a big, is a big thing. We, we need to do more of that. And frankly, we've not been doing enough. That's why you'll hear uh, phrases from MOD such as the Indo-Pacific tilt, yeah, and this idea of, and again, even I've asked, what does tilt? What's a tilt? I, uh, but in, I think in the simplest terms, it's just being more present, understanding it, being able to influence it, be involved, um, and that's very important. But so just those two things in terms of a world that's much, much more unpredictable can quickly become very dangerous. Um, and obviously, the insurance policy against all of that for the nation is defence. And from a Royal Air Force perspective, and I guess I would say this, but we know we all know it's true. It's the RAF that responds at pace and at reach and at range. You know, when when something happens, it's us that deploys immediately. That's played out with tensions bubbling in Sudan. It's the Royal Air Force that responds at a moment's notice. We send aircraft, we, we take people out and remove them from danger and protect the nation's interests. And it's us that enables that. Uh, so global for the RAF, the, the globe's quite small for us because we, we get around it pretty quickly. I'll tell you now, if you're talking space, you know, when I speak to UK Space Command about uh, it's, 
it's quite a it's it's a three day trail to send typhoons to Australia. It's a forty five minute trip on a satellite, so the world's pretty small when you're doing air and space, and but it has become more unpredictable. So we need to be alive to that. Yeah. So so defence uh, doesn't end at the front door. It, it's it's down the whole street. It's in the town. Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's beyond. Yeah. And, and and I think that that's a great point actually because what has changed. Over the last couple of decades, the bulk of my kind of operational career um, has been we 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 have become what what I've called garrison efficient back at home. We've put more eggs in single baskets, um, and this links to the ACE discussion uh, to generate efficiency in headroom, so that we have the wherewithal to deploy forward onto expeditionary ops, and you know get after. Uh, adversaries like ISIS or Al Qaeda, you know, effectively go and chase bad people in deserts that are far away. And I've, you know, we've all, lots of us, have spent the last couple of decades doing that since 9/11. Has completely dominated our thinking and our approach, how we've structured our forces. Uh, when I first joined the Air Force in the early 90s, we were just come out of the Cold War, and we were still configured for a Cold War. Um, and we were we were much better then at doing things like ACE, which I know we'll come on to in a moment. So it feels to me like when we're talking about ACE, a, it feels like I'm really old because I remember when you know back in the good old days when we used to do this. But there, it, there's not an awful not a, a lot of new stuff. It's just going back to what what we have done before. We know we can do this in terms of being more agile in our approach, particularly in the home base, because it's becoming more and more apparent with uh, operations in the dangerous decade, we may have to fight from the home base. In fact, we're fighting from the home base. The Rivet Joint and 51 Squadron are deploying from Waddington every other day to go and fly combat missions in the Black Sea or the Barents Sea to do intelligence collect and uh, you know when we, our people are taking those risks every day and they're doing it from from the home base they're not deployed forward mm -hmm. in Kandahar or Basra they're doing it from RAF Waddington or other bases and um, this discussion is quite timely because I'm I'm on a bit of a campaign to try to wake the Air Force up to this point that we we need to be ready to fight from the home base and frankly we're not and there's quite a bit of work to be done on, on how we get after that. And the starting point for it is agile combat employment. OK, that's interesting, because uh, from looking into agile combat em employment, it, it comes across as being expeditionary. And you're talking about um, operating from the home base. So let's just stop the clock there and tell us what is agile combat employment? So in a nutshell, uh, to bring it to life, it's probably easy to just use a scenario. So at the moment, we do we mount quick reaction alert from in the north from RAF Lossiemouth. It's a fixed base. Everything's fixed there. The logistics supports it. It's a very, very well-oiled machine, and they do it phenomenally well. But they're fixed at Lossie, which makes Lossie quite an interesting target. If you were so minded as an adversary, you could see that as an Achilles heel. So there are different ways to, to get around defending that. You either have a very complex and complicated integrated air and missile defence system, and you have your fixed site, but you defend it. Um, we're not in that place, and I think that's widely recognised. We were in the Cold War. We're not anymore because the threat hasn't been there. It is starting to come back if it is not already, and I can come back to that in a second. Um, so if you're not necessarily in a place to defend it, then you have to be much more agile in how you do it. So to bring the, to bring the ACE concept to life, a challenge I could set would be to the station commander at Lossiemouth, you are to continue to do QRA North, um, but I don't. But you're not allowed to have your assets in any one single place for any more than one day at a time. Keep moving. Be a, be a, be a moving target. Don't sit. Like a boxer. Like a boxer. So that 
to me, if you think of it like that, that's what agile combat employment is. Um, and the reality is when you really kind of get under the skin of it and say, well, how do we do that? There's a cultural piece. There's a piece around our people being being ready to do that, to move around quickly, be agile, be fleet of foot, be ready to go, a readiness and a resilience to it. Back in the day, we would have called that Bergen ready. You know, my first tour, um, you know, it's taken me this, I don't know how long we've been going in the podcast. I'm sure someone will have a sweepstake taken on how long it takes me to talk about being a Harrier pilot. But anyway, <laughs> I lay, on my first tour on the on Harrier Squadron, we were still doing this because it was and a strike tail, command. Yes, and it was the tail end of the Cold War in the early 90s. And we had two lockers in work, one for your flying kit and one for your deployment kit. And your deployment kit was packed and ready to go so that if, if at any stage in work the hooter went, you would go to your deployment kit locker, pick it up, you knew you had everything you needed, and you stepped out the door and you went. And we practiced that quite regularly. It was, it was just it was in our DNA. We've not had to do that since the mid-90s because our role and the adversary has been different. So we've not necessarily had to do it. And we've fallen out of the habit of it. And I think we need to try to get back. So there's a cultural thing around the readiness and the resilience of it. There's also a logistics piece around it because back in those days, we had all the logistics support to do that. So my first squadron, three fighter squadron, a uh, brilliant squadron. Uh, we um, yeah, we had our own MT. We had all our own four-ton trucks. We had our own little regiment flight that could do force protection just for the squadron. And so it was a instead of it being the size of a squadron, it was like twice the size, but it had all these support elements on it. And when that hooter would go, the whole kind of circus would leave, and we'd trundle off into somewhere in northern Germany and live in a forest for a few weeks, and then we'd come back. Um, now, I'm not saying we need to go and live in forests, but if I were to ask the station commander from Lossie, not to throw him under the bus here, because <laughs> I'm sure he'd have a good go at it, but I want you to keep doing QRA for the next three weeks, but you can't be in any one place for more than 24 hours at any time. That would be quite the challenge. Well, I, I know that we are already exercising ACE, and uh, I think a couple of years ago, we um, squadron deployed to Stornoway, yeah. where there isn't much... Yeah there in terms of uh, base support yes and so the support had to go out there what, what else are we doing in terms of exercising and and, and relearning some of these faded yeah. skills so there's a so before we kind of get in jump into doing it we've we've spent quite a bit of time just trying to understand it you know before we before i go out to folk and say right just do this and People will have a good go at it, but it'll be, you know, be like a scattergun approach. So we've done quite a bit of work in recent months to pull together quite a clear directive. You know, what does it mean? Doctrinally, if you want to get, go and learn the doctrine, it's all there. And we've, we've kind of pulled that all together now. So that's good. And it is important that you have that baseline established. So just at the start of this year, uh, after some really good work from across the headquarters and beyond, we were able to get a directive out on, this is what ACE is, this is what it means for us, this is why we're doing it. So I'm hoping that that has filtered down to the stations and uh, the people are talking about it at the very least and that they're trying to get an understanding of it. Um, so now that we've got that done and we've developed a concept of operations and the A5 team, this this strategic planning team and 11 group are all over this. We're trying now to back it into the exercise program as we go forward. So my challenge to AOC 11 group who owns the exercise program for the service has been where we can, every exercise we do should have an element of us exercising ACE. So for example, uh, you might be deploying a typhoon squadron to the Middle East, let's say, to go and do magic carpet out of historically a base called Thumbrate. We do it out of there practically every year. Um, but I've already said, so the next time we do that, next year, we'll go. But during that three-week period, I would like you to exercise an ACE profile where you up sticks from Thumbrate, you go to Masana and you do it from a different base, but you continue 
to execute on the program uh, or the exercise objectives to prove that we're agile enough to do that and we can work through all of the friction that that will bring because it will bring it, it you know it will well, we've got, we've got a very high tech air force now with our fourth and fifth mm -hmm. generation aircraft yeah where they rely heavily on our air tanker fleet yeah. to keep them in the air yeah and that all generates another level of, of support requirement. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is going to be a huge challenge for us, I isn't think it? I, actually less the tanker stuff, because actually that enables us, that gives us more flexibility. And, you know, again, we're proving that every day with Ukraine and the likes. But um, for me, those highly technical airplanes um, tend to have to come back to the mothership to plug into the hub because they're data driven. And we're seeing this play out with, with assets like the A400, so the, the Atlas. Phenomenal aeroplane. You know, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around C, or, you know, the venerable C-130 going out of service this year after many decades of just awesome service to the, to the RAF. But an A400, you know, carries twice as much, goes twice as far, is exceptional capability. Um, and it's just that next generation of... It's like people uh, moving on from the Harrier, isn't well, it? Well, it's a wee bit, yeah. <laughs> well, there, it is, and I, I can come back to that. You're right, because, you know, I would land in the field in a Harrier, and, it, you know, it wasn't that difficult for me as a pilot to do a quick turnaround on a Harrier, and we were pretty much all called to do that. I would struggle on an F-35. Now, the big difference, if you want to just kind of bring this to life, is when I was a young pilot and my engineer would walk out to the jet with me, he'd be carrying a toolbox. Today, they carry a laptop. Yeah. It's two different things, you know, and so it's a, it's a, they're data-driven platforms. And the way we've managed that, back to A400, is the, the, the system, the data system that, that makes the A400 work kind of plugs into RAF Bryce Norton. So when you go away with the aeroplane, if you're away for an extended period of time and you've not been able to plug back into the mothership, that causes the aeroplane some issues because the aeroplane was not necessarily brought into service to be able to do that. It was always this idea that it would come back to its home airport. We can't think of places like Bryce Norton as an airport anymore. We've got to get back to this idea of it, it, it could be a war fighting base. And we've got to be able to shift around and take the capability with us and be agile. It's all about that agile word, frankly. Um, and like I say, this is as much about culture as it is about enabling the technology to do it with the right logistics and the right you know, widgets that are required, the right connectivity. The difference from when I did it in the early 90s to where we are today is that since then and today, We've had this thing called the internet, and we've had this kind of explosion in how to network. We've got a much better ability to run our business with data at its center. Um, and I think there is a, that will help make ACE more achievable with really high-end capability. The fact that, frankly, as you know, you can, as long as you've got a signal, you can get data anywhere. And when you've got a space command and you've got an ability to access things like a low Earth orbit constellation that does high definition broadband globally, then you, are all, you can always be connected. It's about organizing that in a multi-domain way. How much influence has there been in the thinking uh, with um, ACE as far as the US Air Force's yeah. uh, development? And I, as I understand that, the concept was reborn, let's say, by, uh, from the uh, United States Air Force in the Pacific. Yes, so the, so each of the different regions of the world, so you, you know, um, for those that may not be aware, the US uh, split the world up into regions and they're called combatant commands. Um, and each of the de COCOMs is what it's abbreviated to. And each of the COCOMs, so Pacific Command, Europe Command, Central Command, the Middle East, uh, each of them all have an approach to ACE, but they're all different. And rightly so, because each region 
uh, demands and dictates a different way to do it. So, for example, in the Pacific, uh, you're absolutely right. The, their biggest challenge there is the tyranny of distance, particularly if the scenario was around protecting or defending Taiwan, then you know, the, the, the distances involved are enormous. And we've been doing quite a bit of planning on this recently. And when you look at the requirement for air-to-air -air refueling just to be able to do that type of a mission, um, it's enormous. So this idea of uh, force multipliers and enabling assets is really very key. But part of, part of that construct is the ability to hop around those island chains that we see in the Pacific, particularly the second island chain. And those people that are interested in Second World War history will know that, I mean, this is how it all happened in the Pacific campaign in the Second World War. They hopped from little island to little island. They crushed coral uh, to make runways. And actually, the uh, Pacific Air Forces are reconstituting those airfields at the moment, all those old World War II, Saipan, and all these names that you'll know from history. So they have a different concept to it, hopping around the island chains. In Europe, in UCOM, it's about uh, enabling NATO to be much more agile. So ACE in Europe is how do we leverage each other's bases? How do we leverage all the, the thousands of civilian bases are there? Um, so a few years ago, when I was AOC One Group, we were trying, we were, we were just closing uh, RAF Lukers, um, and that gave us a bit of a challenge around where can we hold an armed diversion for QRA from Lossy Mouth, which historically was Lukers. Um, and we just made the assumption, well, there's all the civilian airports if we need to divert, you know, um, Aberdeen, Inverness, Presswick, Edinburgh, We'll just dive in there, no problem. Right, well, best we speak to those airports and make sure everybody's happy. And none of them were. None of them were. They were not happy with us putting a typhoon in on a diversion with missiles on board into a civilian airport. Understandably. So we were left with a quandary, which we solved by keeping part of Lookers open. When we thought we would close the whole thing down, we've had to keep it effectively as a 24-7 diversion. That in itself proved the challenge around resilience, which could have been made much easier if we had access to all of those civilian airports. So one of the things we're trying to do in terms of ACE in the homeland, ACE for, near, uh, for NATO in Europe, is have a discussion with civilian airports around if, if it did go horribly wrong, if there was uh, a spillover of the Ukraine war with Russia into Eastern Europe and it became a NATO thing, we may need to have access to your airstrips to give us the resilience and the agility to move around, uh, to effectively act as a deterrent, not be an easy target for someone like Russia. And those discussions are ongoing. So you're um, not talking about main operating bases here, you're talking about sort of a more temporary forward yeah, operating a base? Yeah, in and out, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, the, we have it well within our gift to land an A400 at any base, use it as a as a hub, land two F-35s at that same base, refuel those F-35s from the A-400, maybe even rearm the F-35s at that base quickly, and then move on, pack up shop, move to the next place. And we should, in, in the ideal world, if you're getting ace right, be able to just stay on the move all the time so you're never predictable. And every now and again, dip back into your home base to kind of get to plug back into the mothership to get the top up that you might need to do a reset. Um, and that That's the utopia. I'd love to be able to get there. And in terms of, you know, how, how do we get there? As I mentioned before, using our exercise program through this next year to flush this all out. Um, and one of the challenges I've set to 11 Group for next year, so into 2024, is this idea of what I've been calling an ACE eval or an ACE evaluation. Back in the day, we would have called it a TAC eval, a tactical evaluation. Um, and we're already on a path to building towards an ACE eval to, just to, to give ourselves a test to see how well we've positioned ourselves to do it. I am not at all naive enough to think that that will be perfect. 
I'm pretty confident that we'll flush out an awful lot of challenge. I'm very confident that we'll flush out a lot of areas where we need to start a discussion around finding new money uh, or reapportioning other money to pay for things uh, like more logistics, more connectivity, better networking, uh, more flexible comms, etc. Um, but until we've done the exercising and we've flushed it all out, we won't really know what it, where, the, where the holes are. So, so it's the exercise isn't to prove the concept, it's to develop the concept. It is, yes. It's as much by uh, failing. You know, I'm very, com very uh, confident that parts of our, ab of our ability to do this will fail. Um, and that's okay. You know, that will help then really clearly identify. We tried our very best in these areas, but we just simply don't have the logistics to do it or we just simply don't have the people or the capability. So then it's a, then that presents us with options at the top of the Air Force. We either reapportion money to fix that so that we're better at it, or we accept that that's a hole in our capability and we understand and hold the risk and try to mitigate it in a different way. I, I should imagine some of our people listening to this will be thinking, oh, this, this is going to be more stretch for us. We're, al we're already bursting, breaking here. What will this mean to our people? Yeah, when we so I, I think, so I can understand why people would think that. I actually think there's quite an excitement around it. Um, cause, I mean, this is the sort of stuff I joined up to do, and I think most of our people are the same. They want to get their hands dirty and get out and do this stuff. They don't necessarily want to be back at home base in your blues all day, you know, maybe that's just me. But I think most people are quite excited about doing the hands-on up stuff, particularly if we can do it at home. I guess it's balance, though, that people yeah, like in their absolutely. life. Yeah. And there is a balance to this. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't by any stretch me saying, right, let's get everyone on a war footing. We're ready to go at five minutes notice. Um, that, not, not at all. Um, so, yes, there will be, it's, it will be a different approach and we'll be asking and expecting our people to be a bit more ready and resilient. So I'll, I'll, if, you, if you can bear with me, I'll tell a little story of when I was the station at, Mar at Marham. So I was the station commander at Marham, uh, 2013 to 15. And when I arrived there, um, having come from years in the Harrier Force to what was uh, a really well-founded tornado force, Base, doing exceptionally well on operations, but deployed. So they, their approach to the, the base's approach to ops was we deploy. We go to Kandahar or we go to places abroad. We do our ops, we do very well, uh, best in the world, frankly, and then we come back home. And when we're back at Marham, it's all very nice in Norfolk, and we do a reset on the base, and then we deploy again. The base itself, though, was not necessarily resilient enough to be, um, let's call it, a war fighting or an operational base. Whereas back in the Cold War, it was. In fact, it was a nuclear yeah. base back in the day. And this really was brought to life for me. So there's about 4,000 service people on the base when I took over. And a few weeks into um, me being the station commander, I was actually, it was a Friday night and I was out for dinner with my wife in the local pub and I get a phone call typically halfway into dinner, you need to come back, there's an emergency. So we can, it was a horrific night, horrible weather. And we come back and there'd been a tragic helicopter crash. So, uh, one of the special forces helicopters from Mildenhall had crashed on the North Norfolk coast. And there were four, four people on board and they'd all tragically died in the crash. It crashed right on the beach. Um, they'd flown through at low level in this awful weather. Uh, they'd flown through a big flock of seagulls and birds um, and just trashed the, the helicopter and they'd crashed and all tragically lost their lives. So we were asked, could we put a cordon in to protect the crash site until the next day to when other folk could come and start to do all the things. The last thing we wanted was just civilians stumbling across this. And so we needed to protect and preserve the scene and all of that. And so on a base of 4,000 people at 
10 o'clock on a Friday night, which was, hor you know, horizontal rain and 40 knot winds. I needed to find 120 people to go and put that cordon in. I could not find 120 people that had waterproof clothing. I couldn't find anybody on the camp that knew where we had 12 by 12 tents just to put up something where people could get a bit of shelter and get a cup of tea and, you know, warm up and then go back out and stand guard. I couldn't find any of that gear. And we muddled our way through and we did an OK job of it, you know, mostly because people are good people and they just put the effort in. But when we, when we subsequently did the debrief on it, you know, I was quite demanding of the station and said, this is absolutely ridiculous. We are phenomenal at ops when we go downrange. We, there's no one can touch us. But back here, we're all just a little bit going to the office and that's not good enough. That's not how we should do our business. And we changed that and we changed it both culturally and in our, and in our approach to how we did things on the camp by doing one thing. And we, adop we adopted this idea of what we call tactical Tuesdays. So on a Tuesday, you came to work in your combat gear. You came to work in your what is now MTP. And if it was raining, you wore the Gore-Tex that you had. Mm -hmm. And it meant that people had to get it because some people didn't have it or they did have it, but it was a thousand years old or their boots hadn't fit, didn't fit. Or worse, they'd got their boots issued but had never once worn them. So it at least flushed that out. And it amazed me how many people on the camp didn't even have that gear. Yeah, they would have had all the desert gear, yeah. but not the yeah. CS95 that we used and to wear. And for weeks and weeks, I would drive around going places and I'd spot someone on a Tuesday in their blues and I'd stop in the car with my little flag. I'd be like, hey, why are you not in your gear? I don't have it, sir. Fine, get in the car and I will give you a lift to stores. And we went and had that discussion and we eventually got, everybody got all the gear. We then, I had a really, really very good young regiment officer and I hope he listens to this. I'll give him a shout out. His name is Steve McCann, an absolute rock star. And I gave him the task of introducing challenges on a tactical Tuesday. So you'd be cycling to work in your combat gear and come across a car accident or uh, an IED or the, the just li little scenarios to force people to just constantly be in that mindset as opposed to I'm at home base now I just go to and from work and it's a nine to five job and we know we're not in a nine to five job they can't you can't have that mindset particularly when you're on a frontline base and really quickly he turned that around the best the best scenario he did where he realised there was a set of young officers who went for lunch every day for their nice one hour lunch break and uh, he intercepted them on their way to lunch at the mess and took them into Ladywood Forest that's beside the officers mess there in that lovely setting at Marham and said we are having lunch today but it's via these ration packs <laughs> um, and practically none of them knew how to cook the new ration pack because when they were introduced to rations, it was at IOT, at officer training, and things had remarkably moved on since mm. then. So it was just good learning, and, you know, most of them had good fun, I would have assumed. Um, but it's just those little things in terms of how do you, with a small tweak, create some cultural change at the front line where people feel like they're more resilient and ready, this idea of being Bergen ready. Re reactive and, and proactive, ready at the same time. Yes, and yeah. there's a role for us all, particularly on some of the bases that you would historically think, don't do that. I would like to see that construct here at RAF High Wycombe, because if, if there was a base that is focused on this is a staff function here, well, why does it have to be? This base is every bit as functional as a war fighting base. In fact, that's the history of it. So might we see you in your flying suit around? You might. Yeah. Yeah, okay. or at least in combat at some point. <laughs> OK. What can our people do to help enable agile combat employment? That's a, such a good question um, because I think, you know, I have ideas, right, and I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there who'll be going, oh, my word, you know, what's he, what's he talking about? But 
I, I think a lot of our, the young folk, particularly coming just through training and into the service, you know, I would like to almost personally challenge them on what are your ideas around what we should be doing here? It's simple. I just want you to be more agile. And if you start with this baseline challenge of, I want you to keep doing your day job, but you have to be in a different location every 24 hours. How are you going to do that? How are you going to stay connected to the machine and make the Air Force work if you have to move every 24 hours? What's that look like and how do you do it? And they will be best placed to know where the challenges are around that. I'll have a, I'll have a punt at it. But you know, if someone asked me to do that as DCOM Ops, it would take me probably 45 minutes to come up with it. Well, here's how I would do that. Here's and, and how the I would point, make that work. The point of that is to disrupt. The, the, the idea is that you're talking about disrupting uh, adversary planning. So it's complicating presenting dilemmas to the adversary. It's complicating their targeting solutions. If we do nothing, then we have five main operating bases on, in, on, in the UK. You know, all of our ISR, which is, which is you know, providing such critical intelligence to inform what we do around Ukraine. We have two bases that do um, QRA North and South. And we have one base that does F-35 fifth gen support to carrier. And we have one base that does our uh, air mobility, single big bases. It is not that long ago that a certain nation did a chemical warfare attack on home soil here in the UK at Salisbury. What if they decided to do five of those on five bases? How would we, how would we do our business? How would we get the whole of the camp through the front gate at RAF Coningsby if there was a Novichok attack at that front gate and it was locked down for the next three months? What's that look like? Where's your resilience to that? How do you get people onto that camp in a way that you didn't miss a heartbeat in doing it? Just simple challenges like that, that you then practice. That will bring agility in its own right. So I, I think my challenge to our people is, you know, the, it's within your own gift here to get after the agility. I don't want to have to be spoon feeding folk we don't, frankly, we don't have time to do that. I think we've been quite clear on the direction that we want to go. We will enable things like the exercise program to really bring this to life and to allow us to flush out where the holes are and to test ourselves. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a, there's a challenge that I would set to everybody in the service and not just those in uniform, the whole force of what's, what's your approach to this? What would it mean for you? Even if they take the time to think about it, they've at least thought about it where before we weren't. So how will we know if we've got ACE right? So I, I think, uh, well, it's like all, all pl no good plan survives contact with the enemy. So, um, you know, on the day of the races, you'll know whether you got it right or not. Um, it would be foolish of us, though, to not be preparing for that. You know, it's that standard... Uh, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Um, at the moment, we have prepared for the best. We've prepared for efficiency across our bases, um, and we need to be better than that, frankly. So I, I think what we do with the exercise program to try to flush out where the holes are, and we talked about that earlier, um, and I'm really keen, you know, this is not about pass or fail. It's about give it your best effort and then identify where our holes are and I know they're there, particularly on the logistics side, particularly on some of our policies and processes, on things like uh, weapons and explosive safety. You know, we have very clear rules and regulations around that for peacetime. If you've got a typhoon with missiles on it, it can only park in certain spots at certain bases. Well, what if I wanted to go to Presswick? Or what if it's going to nip into Wittering for just four hours and then it's going to step off from there back up to Coningsby? What's that look like if it's fully armed? How do we make those processes and policies work? Um, we can only flush that out with exercising, and hence my big push on the exercise programme. And I think this idea around having some form of an AC val where we can test ourselves and we should challenge ourselves, you know, fight. Uh, you know, train hard, fight easy, all, all these little quips, but they do 
they are right. And there is something about that in terms of us trying to test ourselves through an AC Val construct. Um, I'm not quite sure of how the dates are settling, but I would like us to have our first go at that next year. Um, and I think it'll take between now and then for us to get our ducks in a row to be able to have a decent go at it. It won't be perfect, and that is okay. Um, there will be parts of it that fail, and that will be okay. And I guarantee that we won't fail because our people aren't trying their best, because we've not enabled them properly. And I'm really keen to see where those fails happen. And then we use that as the baseline evidence for me to be able to sit at the many meetings that I sit at, like at the Air Exco or at the Air Force Board, to say, we've done these things, here's where our holes are, I need money to fix that, or I need a change to our training policy to fix that. And it's all for the purpose of being more resilient and being more agile um, in, in terms of you know, being a more effective fighting force. How does ACE fit in with the uh, current model of expeditionary air groups and yeah. expeditionary air wings? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and, and there's a bit of work going on to, to look at how is that fit for purpose? I'm not. So actually, you would think at its heart, expeditionary air wing would lead itself to being agile. But what we have used them for is to basically stand up a permanent base somewhere else in the world. So, it, you know, it does feel a little bit strange that 903 Expeditionary Air Wing has been at RAF Akrotiri since 2014 and hasn't moved anywhere. It's not necessarily very expeditionary. So, so do we so, need to look back to 1944 then? There is. A, well, actually, I think so. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the North Africa campaign and what we learned there both in terms of how we do our land integration properly, how we work jointly, you know, that idea of bringing headquarters together and all of that, I, I, all of that intrigues me. I think we just relearn that lesson about every decade, every two decades. There's a sine wave of uh, us and how we learn that. Uh, but I think that there is a lot to, there is a lot to be learned from history. I, I keep referring to the Cold War, but there are many other campaigns that had this concept. It's like I say, it's not new. This is not a new thing. It's not a, you know, a bright spark idea. Um, it's just going back to what we used to do because the threats changed and we need to react to that in a slightly different way than where we've been in the last couple of decades. And from what I'm reading, ACE is not just going to be seen in the Royal Air Force, it's going to be seen uh, within our NATO a hundred percent, yeah. I mean, I, w I represented for CAS recently at the NATO Air Chiefs, and I, it was a whole day's worth of discussion. Uh, you know, um, 31 Air Chiefs there, including the, our, our friends from Finland, hopefully soon to have Sweden as well. But you, know, you want to look at, you want to talk about the newest member of NATO, Finland, uh, the best nation in NATO that can do ACE, Finland. They are awesome at it. This is how they do their business. They did not give it up when the Cold War ended. So they will happily land fast jets on a stretch of runway and stop next to a petrol station, fill up with the visor, put some more bombs on and take off and just keep going. Um, their agility on how they bring their reserves into action, they can call forward something like a quarter of a million people over a weekend. Um, so just the agility of that nation which is born out of the fact that they share such a long land border with Russia. So they feel that threat, intimately feel it, on their eastern border. Um, where we've had this luxury of a bit of geography between us and, uh, and the Russian bear for a while here while we've been off doing our thing in, in the Middle East. Um, so, uh, you know, there are huge lessons to be learned from other nations. But I, I keep saying to people, the Finns are awesome at this. They really are. But they do it in a, in, a, in a way that works for Finland. That may not necessarily work for us. I don't think we'll be in a place where we'll be landing typhoons on the M1. <laughs> but we might be in a place where we want to land typhoons into Birmingham Airport. Today, that would be practically impossible if they had weapons on board. I think we can get to a place where we could make stuff like that happen, which would just give us much more agility in how we do our business, if indeed we ever had to fight from the home base. An exciting future for ACE within the Royal Air Force. 
Very much so. Very uh, uh, looking forward to it. It's going to be a brilliant journey. Air Marshal Half Smith, thank you for being on Inside Air and sharing your insights. Thanks very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. This is Reheat, a look back at some recent news stories from the Royal Air Force. I'm AS1 Victoria Andrews. His Majesty King Charles has thanked the armed forces for their exceptional contribution to the coronation. Aviators were amongst 7,000 military personnel from across the UK and Commonwealth who participated in ceremonial activities from processions, flypasts, music and street lining, which the King noted were carried out faultlessly. The coronation was the largest ceremonial operation for 70 years. Write-ups, pictures and videos documenting the event and preparations can be viewed on the RAF website and social channels. Elsewhere, in operational news, the Royal Air Force has conducted its final civilian evacuation flight from Sudan. The passengers were airlifted to Cyprus on board a 47 Squadron C-130J Hercules. The military have been providing support in the form of planning, logistics and medical expertise. At home, the French Navy and Italian Air Force have arrived at Oria Flossiemouth to take part in Exercise Formidable Shield, a large-scale NATO exercise taking place over the North Atlantic. In total, 13 Allied and partner nations will take part, which will see Oria Flossiemouth Poseidon and Typhoon teams operate alongside 35 other aircraft, 20 ships and almost 4,000 NATO personnel. Held biannually, Exercise Formidable Shield allows participating nations to practice and assess their ability to share situational awareness and carry out NATO-level mission planning. And finally, in the United States, aircrew have begun their training on Protector or G Mark I, which will see the first pilots, sensor operators and mission intelligence coordinators qualify to operate the aircraft. The remotely piloted aircraft system is equipped with a suite of advanced equipment and precision strike weapons, and thanks to detect and avoid technology, it will be able to fly in busy, unsegregated airspace with an endurance of 40 hours. RAF I-Star Force Commander Air Commodore Simon Strasden said how the increased capability, flexibility and lethality of Protector brings a step change in how the RAF supports UK defence. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm AS1 Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That was the sound from inside the cockpit of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight's Lancaster bomber. The Avro Lancaster became one of the RAF's most successful four-engined bombers during World War II, and it's probably most famous for its role in the Dambusters raid. On the evening of the 16th of May 1943, 19 crews of 617 Squadron set out from RAF Scampton to destroy three dams with special bouncing bombs. Two of the three dams were breached successfully, and Wing Commander Guy Gibson was awarded the Victoria Cross for leading the operation. Between October 1941 and October 1945, a total of 7,377 Lancasters were built, which equipped 57 RAF Bomber Command squadrons by the end of World War II. Remarkably, over 80 years later, there are still two airworthy Lancasters in the world. That's all for this episode of Inside Ear. Please give us a review, subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.